I think you'll see the biggest thing that sticks out in terms of what's different is the size of the opportunity that you're chasing, the size of the market that you're chasing. If, if you're chasing a really big market with a business model that has really big margins, you have a chance to make a lot of mistakes and still get it right. If you're chasing a really small market and you've got a product with really small margins, for example, you're in the ad tech business and you're selling an ad from one place and selling it to another place, buying it from one place, selling it to another place, and you've got maybe a 10% margin, you don't have a lot of room for error. And we really you know, believe through our experience that it was more important to get like the first 25, 35, 50 people in the company right than it was to hire really quickly. Because if you're in a big market with a big opportunity, whether you ship your product this month, next month, or next year is not really going to matter. Um, what's important is that you get it right because you only get one chance to get it right. There's a lot of other tricks and techniques that go into the methodology we built. Um, I and mean, I'll give you one more just that's, that's kind of a useful thing to take away is I call it torque, threat of reference check. So I'm interviewing you as a sales engineer for the Northeast. And Fadi comes in and let's say he's worked with um, Oracle in Boston. I say, hey Fadi, that's great. You worked as an SE for Oracle in Boston in five years. Where would you rank yourself you know, amongst the other people that were working in the Northeast as sales engineers for Oracle? Top 2%. Top 2%, he tells me. Cool. That's fantastic. So who are some of the other people you know, that were in the top 2% there at Oracle? Uh, some losers, but I we kick their ass all the time. Well, you can, <laughs> just just g give me the names of one or two Johnny other people. And, that. And, and, and yeah, great. Right. So yeah. I've got their names down. Right. Well, where are they working now? You know, well, yeah, one's over right. here, one's right. over there. Great. So who did you work for there? <laughs> I, I worked, you know, I worked for Joe so and so. Well, well, what would he say about you? You know, oh, how do you spell his last name, by the way? And where is he working now, right? And so, by establishing this this rapport of detail with him, I'm doing two things. One is he knows I'm likely to call these people and call his boss and verify, you know, anything that he's telling me right now. The other thing I've just done, though, is I've walked out of that interview with at least two more names of candidates that I'm going to go tee up and try to interview, <laughs> right? I mean, why do I need somebody from Hydric and Struggles when I got the guy right here who knows the best sales engineers from Oracle in the Northeast because they were in the top 2% with him? What did you do to get those meetings in the first place before your research? Why those companies wanted to meet you? What did you, what did you tell them? Why would they share all the information about their current uh, technology. So there's only, there's, in my mind, there's only one reason why people do that. It's because they know you or they know somebody that knows you. So through connections? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. That plays the biggest part, I think? Yep. Okay. I mean, you can have the greatest idea in the world, but if you don't have a warm introduction to somebody... So you made those connections with the previous startups, right? Yeah, or, you know, it's like the interview idea. I would talk to a guy at GE that I knew that I had sold to before, and I'd ask him if he could give me the names of five other people that I could call. And if I only get one of them, you know, to connect with, great. I love this thought that entrepreneurship is, um, you know, it's not a fixed destination. It's, it's something you're always doing. Um, you're, you're kind of programmed to do this for some reason. And, uh, it took me a long time to figure out that I was programmed to do this. Um, when I was graduating from business school, everybody was going to Wall Street, um, and people just thought I was absolutely nuts to turn down a job with Drexel Burnham and in investment banking and move to California and start a software company. It was, I think it was kind of viewed as, well, you're a failure if you're going to go be an entrepreneur. The entrepreneur equals failure, right? And I think I did it in the beginning because I just liked to create things and I didn't, I could never see myself going and working on somebody else's idea. I, I, I use this simple question when um, people are in between jobs or they're thinking about leaving somewhere and, and they say, well, can I talk with you about what I might do next? And so I have this simple question I ask them and we sit down and I say, okay, so you say you want to go work at a startup. Do you have to be a founder? They say, well, I think it'd be cool to be a founder. And I say, no, do you have to be a founder? <laughs> and if they don't say, yes, I have to be a founder, I could never do anything else, then they're not a founder. If you could do, it, if you could do something else, then you're not a founder. If there's nothing else you can do other than be there on day one as part of the original idea, then you're, you're a founder.